era rangatira mate na koutou katoa uh, ki oki hoa o te wharewānanga o tōka o te whanganui a tāra ngā mihi nui ki a koutou um, ki te tangata whenua o tēnei rohe o whanganui o tāra tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa um, and thanks Kerry for your very warm mihi and welcome and uh, I think I'm amongst a lot of friends here, so <laughs> like, nice to see uh, old and new friends. Um, I'm going to talk mainly tonight about a piece of research that I did with Paparangi and colleagues at Te Kupinga Haora Māori. And so <coughs> those of you who heard me talk about this morning may want to go to the beach. Because to be honest, I know, having lived in Wellington, that you have about two days like this on a good year. <laughs> and if this was Northland, everyone would be at Sandy Bay surfing. They wouldn't be listening to me. Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, I, I really appreciate the privilege of talking to you guys and um, having you in the room. And, and Tony, don't ask me too many difficult questions. Okay. <laughs> um, and I... I put this photo of Iritakura up here to remind me about what it's all about, really. And some of you will know Elena Taipaki Pakikuras, this is her daughter, named after her Whare Tupuna at Waipiro Bay, which is a very beautiful place where they got married, he, she and Mu. But I guess it's about that face of our children and the potential and the hope and the things they inspire in us to do. Um, and I guess holding that vision of, of a place that we want to live in, which is really a place where all children have the potential to develop um, fully and to be able to develop in their own uh, communities, their own hapu, their own whānau to have access to te ao Māori and te reo Māori or to their own um, culture and worldview. And so I guess um, because we can quite easily slip into that deficit model of everything being pretty awful, um, I kind of keep that in my mind because I'm, I think, essentially an optimist. <laughs> um, and I guess the other thing that's had an impact on why I feel sort of passionate about child health is because, apart from the fact that you'd have to be slightly sort of biologically mad if you weren't, I mean, as a species. Um, I, I've worked in lots of places, including South Sudan, where these young boys were always very fascinated because it, I was the only white person they'd ever seen. <laughs> so they'd come up and go, kawaja, kawaja. <laughs> but I think kids have that curiosity and that natural interest in people that sometimes we also lose. And, and the other thing that this reminds me of is some of the global inequities in child health. So we can get pretty upset about the ones um, that we see in front of our noses if we open our eyes here, but um, there's plenty all around the world. Um, this is in Pakistan where we were working in a, um, after the big floods a couple of years ago. Um, in Myanmar, where Doctors Without Borders has a very large HIV program with a lot of children a lot of orphans and, and children with HIV. And children such as these in a refugee camp in Eastern Chad, um, so growing up in a refugee camp, with probably better access to healthcare than they had in Darfur, actually, but um, with pretty basic conditions. Um, and closer to home in uh, Samoa, uh, after the tsunami, um, where I had the privilege of being asked to go and help out for a few weeks <laughs> then and, and really, again, um, the, the sort of vitality of the human spirit, I guess, is always quite inspiring, even amongst crisis. And some of the discussions, I think, around, uh, you know, post-earthquake Christchurch have often talked about that. Of course, the long run is often tough. We can't forget that. So I guess the background to the research study that I'm going to talk about was that um, we all know that child health inequities in Aotearoa New Zealand um, have been well documented. Um, 
when we look at things like uh, bronchiectasis or bronchiolitis or rheumatic fever or infectious diseases, you know, the work of Michael and Tony and the Eru Pormani Centre and many of my colleagues in Auckland and so on, um, well documents these significant inequities in health outcomes for our children. And not only are they significant, they've been around for a long time. These are not new inequities. And I guess we have to remember that the definition of an inequity in health is something that, or an inequality that is um, amenable to policy change, that is seen as unnecessary or preventable. And some of us would also say unfair. Some people think that's too moral a judgment to pass, but I would tend to use it. Um, and I think also the more we know about um, child development, fetal development, child health, the more we understand how these kind of inequities have a lifelong effect and contribute significantly to the disparities we see in adult health as well. So the kind of work that, um, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm jet lagged, so I'm having a mental blank about his name, but he's, you know, the scientific advisor to the Prime Minister and all that. Yeah. That guy, yeah, Druckmann. <laughs> I mean, the kind of work that he's done on, on um, fetal development and so on, we know from the uh, epigenetic studies and some of the early work done around fetal development, how already at that stage, how significant some of these exposures and inequities are going to be on the life course of those kids and into future generations, in fact. And so we thought, well, th there's those of us around, and probably most of you in this room, that feel that these inequities are, you know, blindingly obvious, there should be something done about them, and let's just get on and do it. But there may be others who don't quite see it that way, and so we felt that it would be perhaps a further kind of addition to the mix, particularly with the current government, um, to add a kind of economic perspective on this. Little did we know that that could be quite difficult, but you know. Um, and the other thing is, is that um, many people will say, well, you know, if the inequities are significant and persistent, and they've been around for a long time, then obviously they're too hard to address and it must be really expensive. And one of the things that we had looked at was um, some costing studies done in the US around adult health inequities, which showed that the cost of doing nothing in terms of adult health, in terms of loss of productivity, um, you know, justice system costs and, and th those kind of things, as well as health sector costs, were fairly significant. Um, up to 15 to 25% of the health sector budget and around 4% of GDP in, in the state. So a significant amount of money. Um, but no one had actually looked at child health inequities, and now I know why. <laughs> um, and we also uh, actually, subsequent to what we'd done, but before we'd published it, um, there were various analyses also being done on the economic cost of child poverty in New Zealand, and there has been some earlier work done also in the UK and the US around this as well. So looking at social costs, <coughs> costs to um, the health sector, to justice, um, loss of employment, um, education opportunities and so on. And most of them came in at around 3% of GDP, something like that, sometimes a bit less. Um, and so there was a sort of a small body of evidence around this, but um, really not a lot that had focused on child health. And so we really just wanted to do a bit of a scoping study because we were aware that we weren't economists, and although we, we got a lot of support from a couple of economists in Auckland, um, we really didn't know whether the kind of analysis that we wanted to do was really feasible with what we had. And so we really set out just to test what the data sets out and some of the assumptions that we could make about the New Zealand context. Um, and so obviously we did a literature review of some of the existing, um, or of the existing literature around costing studies on health inequities. Most of that, a lot of it wasn't in the formal academic literature actually. Um, we also read quite a lot around um, current economic methods and, and some of the underlying assumptions and conceptual ideas behind those assumptions. Um, and quite a bit around some particular health inequities, um, rheumatic fever, bronchiectasis and asthma and things like that, to look at what had already been done in terms of costing and in terms of life course studies. 
which is still pretty limited actually in this area in New Zealand. And we had lots of conversations with economists um, ranging from, well, you know, you're completely nuts, why would you do that? And it's not a cost-benefit analysis, so it's a waste of time and, you know, that kind of thing, to some very helpful suggestions. Um, and of course, remembering that um, costing studies have been used quite extensively by organisations like the Fire Service, ACC, Land Transport, um, and government agencies, which obviously need to put up a case for um, their interventions. Um, we don't, unfortunately, I think, do enough in health, actually. And we also um, managed to get a bit of funding um, from Ngāpai Ote Maramatanga and set up a steering group, um, which was really helpful, included some paediatricians, but also people like Hone Ka and Cindy Kero and various other people with a strong background in child health. So essentially what we also want to do is, is, is sort of move away from a model where it was, you know, the, the sort of deficit thinking and, and the inequity was the problem to what was going on for Tamariki Māori. So using fairly traditional tools in terms of epidemiological analysis, but looking at um, really keeping Tamariki Māori at the centre. Um, and we basically, because we were looking at inequities, so things that were preventable and avoidable, we looked just at potentially avoidable hospitalisations and deaths in the period 2003-2007. Um, and these are as classified by the Ministry of Health and DHBs in, in, the, in the normal analyses they do around potentially avoidable hospitalisations and deaths. And of course there's some controversy about what should be included or not, but we basically use the existing um, ICD coding that the Ministry uses. Um, although some people have questioned this actually, um, we assumed that injuries were fundamentally equally avoidable between Māori and non-Māori children and therefore any difference was an inequity. Um, and we also looked at primary care pharmaceutical and lab data and outpatient data. Um, we couldn't break this down into diagnostic codes just because we just don't code that well in New Zealand in <coughs> primary care yet. Um, and we just estimated utilisation based on rates in each age group and looked at the under utilisation or excess utilisation. Um, and our costing was also quite limited because um, we didn't, it was a scoping study, we didn't go in for fancy economic modelling or anything like that. <coughs> so we looked at what were the costs of publicly funded hospital admissions using Ministry of Health data, primary care and ACC. And we uh, estimated the out-of-pocket payments based on primary care fees. And we looked at loss of earnings based on the fact that an average hospital admission for children is actually only 1.2 nights or something like that, um, just for hospital admissions for loss of earnings for caregivers based on a kind of minimum wage. And we used a value of statistical life, um, the, the base value was the one that's used in land transport and fire safety and government agencies in New Zealand, which is about $3.2 million. Now that's always a tricky thing because a lot of people, especially in, in the health sector, feel pretty ambivalent about assigning of money to a value of life. Um, but I guess we didn't, we, we did, um, do some sensitivity analysis around the variance in that, and it actually was a big determinant, of course, of the final costs. But um, we wanted to make it comparable with other cost studies that have been done in New Zealand. For example, there's been um, costs of injury studies done for ACC, there's been costs of suicide, there's been costs of um, cardiovascular disease and stroke and things like that. So we use similar values. And then we we did do some other sensitivity analysis around discounting, which I'll talk a bit about later on. Um, so basically we, we looked at if you had equitable numbers of avoidable deaths and illness and healthcare utilisation between Māori and non-Māori, um, what would that actually have resulted in? And 
that accounted for around 67 deaths every year in Māori that were excess if you looked at the non-Māori rate. So if Māori rates of avoidable death had equaled non-Māori rates, you would see fewer deaths in, in Tamariki Māori. You'd also see fewer admissions to hospital. So none of these things are surprising given the rates are higher, right? This is not news. But the interesting thing was is that um, the rates for outpatient consultations for non-Māori were, were higher. So you would actually, if you had equitable usage of outpatient consultations, you would definitely see more outpatient consultations for Māori than currently you do. You'd have a lot more ACC claims, a lot more GP consultations, and significantly higher numbers of pharmaceutical claims and lab claims. <coughs> so historically, this underutilisation or, or re reduction in access to what are really the sort of gateways into healthcare are, are significant. And so going back to the deaths, what you see is, and this table's horrible, so just I'd focus on the things I've put in red circles, is that the significant, a significant proportion of the deaths is in the one month to under one year of life. Um, so that accounts for a, a large proportion of the deaths. Um, and that's followed by the five to 15 year age group. And if you look at the avoidable deaths in the under one year of age, um, sudden unexpected death in infants is a big contributor. Um, if you look at injury and external causes of mortality, um, what, what's interesting is that the rates for Māori are much higher in the under ones, both for females and males, so seven times, um, and two to three times higher for, for males, and three to four times higher for females. So injury is another big cause of mortality. Um, in those age groups. Um, and certainly in the um, 5 to 15 year age group and the excess deaths in the over ones, um, the numbers actually accounted for nearly 80% of the excess deaths. Um, and when we actually looked at hospital admissions, you've got up near 900,000 admissions in that four year, five year period. Um, for under 15s and in fact the rate between Māori and non-Māori, the crude rate was pretty much the same, so round one. Um, and just over a third of hospitalisations in this whole age group were classified as potentially avoidable. And the interesting thing was that for Māori the, the rate of the potentially avoidable illnesses was much higher um, for Māori than non-Māori in all age groups. Um, and so that's where we got this excess avoidable emissions from um, of, of 3,000 a year. And when I look at my own district health board, this is completely what we see. We have hospital admission rates two to three times, sometimes five to six times for tamariki Māori compared with non-Māori in those kind of areas. Um, our dental intervention rates off the page, actually. <laughs> our oral health is so bad. Um, so I think this is pretty much reflecting the reality of what people in paediatric wards see every day. Um, and yet, given that we see these high rates of avoidable hospitalisation and avoidable mortality, you'd kind of expect, in the greater scheme of things, that you should see more use of primary care to potentially avoid all those things. But in fact, you, you're seeing the opposite. So the GP consultation rate was lower, the pharmaceutical claim was lower, the laboratory claims were lower, ACC claims were lower and they were a lower cost than non-Māori. And specialist, even specialist outpatient visits were lower, particularly for, Māori, uh, for mental health. Um, which again, given the issues around mental health for young people, and, and Māori youth is kind of also a bit scary. Um, and so when we came to the costing exercise, I guess the thing that was unsurprising was that, that 
because you're assigning a value of a life um, and there are a significant number of excess avoidable deaths for Māori, then the majority of the value or the, the cost of these inequities is in the, the value of the statistical life. So that was not unsurprising. Obviously, if you um, have a value of statistical life that's five or six million instead of three million, which a lot of people would argue should be the case now because the value of statistical life hasn't actually changed since at least early 2000s and I think before, um, then that value would be a lot higher. Um, the thing that was striking really around health sector costs and this, remember this is health sector costs within child health. We weren't able to cost out the lifetime cost and I think that would be a really nice challenge for any economist to look at. Um, but actually there was a, a cost saving to the health sector because hospital admissions were actually cheaper than what would be the cost of actually increasing utilisation in primary care. So for a Ministry of Health that's interested in saving money, inequities are quite a good way to go. If you think of it, I mean, it's horrible. But I think, actually, and I think in the, thinking about it in my own DHB, that's also why we have trouble, you know, we have trouble shifting money between services, right? But if you're thinking, I mean, and shifting money out of hospitals is always difficult. But if you're thinking about it, um, there's no incentive financially to move it out of the hospital because it's going to cost you more to achieve equity. So, it, yeah. So, and if, if we did this very sort of basic analysis, we ended up with a sort of ballpark figure of around 200 million a year. Now, depending on changing various costing variables in this, it can probably range anything between 60 and 300 million. And I, I have to tell you, economics isn't really a science, I don't think. <laughs> the economists in the room can pull me down. Um, but I guess, as I said, the, the major cost is the excess deaths. And of course, that's also something that doesn't cost the health sector anything. You know, Sadly, a dead, ba a dead baby doesn't cost the health sector much. Um, and the health sector is actually saving if you just look at child health sector costs. Now, th this is why I'd love someone to do some modelling, because of course the costs going into the lifetime of that person are potentially going to be huge. If you get rheumatic fa fever at the age of eight and you end up with valve replacements and, you know, I mean, you can imagine the social costs of, of loss of employment and loss of productivity, and let alone health sector costs would be huge. So I think it's a really nice challenge for someone to do. Um, but within child health, th there's not a driver, if you like, around moving funding differently. Um, th this, this was just a straight loss of wages cost to families, so it's a very minimal costing, and we didn't cost anything else in terms of suffering, grief, any of the huge costs of time, of emotion, of mm. all the stuff that happens when you've got a kid that's sick. So that's when we put it together, the, the costs plus the house sector savings, which is a negative of course, we're estimated at just under 200 million per year. So it's not really that much actually. I mean it, it's a very conservative study. So. I mean, 200 million doesn't actually sound that much, does it? Um, and as I said, the, the biggest impact on the total cost was whether you have a, st a value of statistical life that's higher or lower. Now, I'll talk a bit about why we think the study needs some more work. <laughs> because one of the interesting things around economic theory is that mostly the... the methods are based around welfare economics and so they're based on the idea of utility and utilitarianism so that as an individual you'll do what you need to do to maximise your own benefit. It's the kind of market idea, you know. And it, so it doesn't really explain a collective idea or have a view on equity as such. And there are some interesting ideas um, around by people like Amartya Sen and others that have written about health uh, capabilities and health as a capability and things like that. But in fact, the methods haven't kind of developed to really 
conceptually pin it around any idea of inequities or equity. And some of the other assumptions, of course, in economic theory are also difficult to apply in the health sector because um, you're supposed to be fully informed and be able to make free choices about you know, your health and your health care options and your risks and things like that, which I think even in the best scenario, most of us would agree is kind of odd, especially for children. Um, and then there's various other things that I, you know, that we won't go into, but th that really don't kind of fit conceptually what we're talking about here. And so it was quite difficult to kind of pull that apart. And although economists themselves have critiqued quite extensively their own approaches to um, economic theory, there's no, actually not been a lot of significant development of, of new methods that we could find and in discussion with economists that, that could be helpful. So I think there's a bit of a sort of conceptual gap there. Um, now, economists don't really like cost of illness studies like we've done because really you need to do a cost. It's not a true economic evaluation. You really should be comparing. Um, you should be looking at cost effectiveness or cost benefit studies. So what would you do as an alternative? And how would you look at the cost and the benefits of, of various interventions, for example? Partly because they don't fit the theory very well. I mean, cost of illness studies don't fit the theory very well. And then there's all these other problems that most of us come to as well about saying that a life's worth three million bucks. Um, firstly, some of us have issues with the sort of ethics or moral values around that, um, even if government use it as, uses it all the time to make uh, judgments about whether they're going to build a motorway out of Auckland or you know, a motorway through the Basin Reserve, I guess is your equivalent. Um, there's some evidence that if you survey people, a young person's life will be valued more than an older person's. I suspect that there's a whole lot of cultural and value systems around that that would be interesting to explore further. Um, when we looked at the value of statistical life, um, there's been quite a bit of work and various costing studies done in New Zealand that have looked at different options around this. So. Um, for example, there was some work done around occupational illnesses and accidents in the workplace and a good review done of that. So, you know, there's a suggestion really that ours is very undervalued in New Zealand now and could be up to about 12 million based on international use of um, value of statistical life. But actually there's been no good studies to really see if that is what people would judge as a reasonable value. And then if you're looking at things like quality of life, um, which is something we, we tried to explore as well, um, there's enough contention, I guess, around burden of disease studies and assessing quality of life in adults. Um, but quality of life in children's really difficult. And th there's been some work done in Sheffield and a few other places, but it's still <coughs> quite early. And so we weren't able to do anything with it, really. Um, and certainly not much in New Zealand. So. Um, how a child would view their quality of life, kind of difficult to assess. Um, and th then the issue of discounting is interesting because, um, I mean, essentially this is, economists would say that most of us would value more having a hundred bucks today than having a hundred bucks in ten years' time. And I guess intuitively, most of us would. We'd rather have it in our pocket to be able to spend now um, than in 10 years' time. Um, but when you're looking at it in terms of health outcomes, it means, for example, that if you used an 8% discounting rate, which some people would argue is, is, is a reasonable rate to use, um, that if you're preventing the death of one child with an 80-year life expectancy, um, that if you use an 8% discount rate, that would only be 12 life years. So you can see that discounting is kind of the opposite of your mortgage rate. <laughs> um, it's actually going to make a huge difference in terms of how you value things out into the future. And for example, you, you would wonder about the value of vaccinating kids out into the future because really, if you discounted at a higher rate than 1% or 2%, it probably wouldn't be economically useful, they would say. I mean, I would disagree, but, you know. Yeah. And there's been quite a lot of work actually around climate change and discounting. 
so that's quite an interesting comparison because they're looking at, you know, 100, 500 years out. But even 50 years out, there's so much uncertainty about what is the value of things um, into the future that there's a lot of controversy around discounting. And about how you account for equity between generations. If we're stuffing up the climate, what does that mean for the future generations and how equitable it is to, to pass all that on? Well, you could argue the same thing for health inequities. So there's lots of debate around different rates and what you should do. So we varied that. But uh, w as I say, I think our study was very preliminary and um, you know, we really felt we wanted to lay out a challenge to economists in the end to come up with something better. Unfortunately, I haven't had anyone come back to me yet to say they're going to do it, but if you know anyone who's interested, let me know. <laughs> um, we did look at a few other limitations, um, particularly because we know in primary care the quality of our ethnicity data in New Zealand is still pretty dodgy. I can vouch for that in Northland. Um, but we did think that overall um, it wasn't going to significantly alter the findings um, that we came up with. Um, so I'm just going to come up with a few conclusions now and we can maybe have a bit more discussion um, if you wish or you can go to the beach if you wish. Um, <laughs> I think one of, the, one of the things I really struggled with is that the whole philosophical and conceptual base of traditional economics and costing methods it doesn't really take a view on equity and doesn't really have a position on it so it's kind of it's kind of difficult to grapple with because um, it, it doesn't really fit and it was it was challenging and interesting to discuss things with people who come from a completely different academic world view of things I have to say um, and challenging at times too um, I guess the other thing is, is that a lot of the things that we do in, in health um, do require a degree of ethical judgement and any of this stuff does too, but somehow economists don't make it sound like it's an ethical judgement, they just say, oh we put a 3% discount rate on it, end of story. You know, so it's kind of interesting because everything that's done in a, in a sort of economic analysis has some, has some judgement behind it, but often that's not at all explicit. And certainly when you're talking about children, <laughs> they're not even usually in the picture. Um, we think that the cost of doing nothing and sticking with the status quo around child health inequities is likely to be much higher than what we've come up with the cost to our society is probably a lot higher. We think we've really underestimated the costs, particularly to society and the true economic costs. The other thing that we did, which makes it a very conservative study, is that we compared Māori and non-Māori children in New Zealand. <coughs> because of the way we did it, looking at differences in rates and looking at excess and uh, under rates, um, if, you, if you take Pacific children out as a separate group and look at Māori, Pacific, non-Māori, non-Pacific, because of the rate differences, the inequities actually get bigger. And so, um, in fact, that in itself would seem, would seem to illustrate that we've taken a very conservative um, view of it. And I think the other thing that perhaps is not surprising or shouldn't surprise us but still manages to, is that despite all our best intentions, or the best intentions of some of us, um, health sector spending does appear to privilege non-Māori children. And I think that by really looking at this inequity, we do have the possibility to reduce some of the inequities we see in, in poor health. And so I think not only are the child health inequities we see unfair and potentially preventable and amenable to intervention, and a breach of the rights that we have signed up to for children and the rights that we would expect under Tatiriti. They're also quite costly to our society. Um, but because by definition they are amenable to intervention, um, I think despite the fact that there are structural barriers and issues of power and privilege and who makes decisions and all those things, we can do something about them. 
And although we still need a lot more evidence and evaluation of some of the interventions that have been shown to have some impact, I think most people would agree that those kind of things are quite important. Obviously how they're delivered can be more or less inequitable or equitable in their impact. Um, and so by definition it's not that we don't have some of the answers. We do, and I think we need the political will to apply them. And I guess the last thing is I'd say don't be phased by economists because as Rima, both and Nathan would say, you know, you can do a back of the envelope calculation and it's probably nearly as good as something coming out from university. No, no. But she said, you know, basically you can, you can do a study which will prove that, you know, a new motorway in Auckland is extremely cost effective and useful and will increase your productivity and get you to your cafe for your cappuccino earlier in the morning and that's the important thing. But it's a value judgement in the end whether that is more important than our kids' health, I think. So I think coming back to the kids, it's about having a vision for the potential of our kids for the best health outcomes achievable for our kids. Um, that, you know, that all our children should have the possibility to achieve their dreams. And I'd like to thank all the people that helped with this, um, particularly Paparangi and, and Rima, who was very useful and challenging, and the steering group and the other people at university that really helped with the analysis and so on. So I'm going to kind of stop there um, and happy to answer questions and things. If you want to read the paper, it's in BMC Public Health Open Access 2012. <laughs> um, but I think it's, um, I mean, I think on reflection, what I learnt from it was that we still have to get our own house in order when it comes to health inequities in the health sector and, and where the power and the privilege and the money lies. And so even though as a public health physician I'm also passionate about the other stuff we need to do around housing and income and inequality and all that sort of thing, I think we really also need to make sure that the health sector is pushed into, provoked, is whatever, <laughs> into um, really looking at itself. So I guess that's where I would end for now. Kia ora. yesterday from um, uh, doctors about all this meeting in Europe somewhere. <laughs> yeah. so the jet lag's yeah. kicking in, but I've had three double shots of caffeine, so I'm <laughs> still awake. Okay. Claire, that's great, and I, I saw that in the BMJ and was really delighted that you're grappling with that, because we grappled with the same thing on the Children's Commission expert working group. Um, just a, as you know, I'm on the kind of diet, so I'm some uh, But just having done some cost-benefit studies, just some observations. One, I think counting everybody as an individual um, is quite a good starting point. You remember, you know, Bentham and people were utopians, utilitarians yeah. were the idea that everybody counted, whether you were the king or whether you were someone who was living in the tenements, your life was important. So. It's not such a bad basis for beginning with it. Mm. Um, and I think people like um, Williams has done the yep. idea of fair innings. Yep. You know, if we've got an average life expectancy, just like to use that, you know, the yeah. British cricket metaphor, they should retire at 100, you know, and you should let somebody else have the resources. If you're waiting where resources go, mm. you can then modify the utilitarianism. Yeah, um, to do that. yeah sure. Yeah. Uh, and I thought there was a lot of really interesting discussion on discount values because, um, mm -hmm. as you know, probably Nicholas Stern and the yeah. climate change reports, you know, raised yeah. that same point as yeah. you, why should we discount the future? And um, that, in fact, he recommended that for climate change um, calculations, there should be discount value of zero. You should mm. be claiming things now and depleting what's available in the future. So I think there's a really good argument to make about that. And Treasury's come down from 10 to 5, for yeah. some sure thing. Yeah. Um, and just to say, um, um, 
Michael and I are doing um, work on burden of disease, which I agree with you. It's that cumulative um, distress mm. of ill health and probably the next chronic disease is that, is that huge, huge burden. And we're trying to look at that with some of not just the infectious diseases, but looking at what the impact of poor housing might be. Um, so we, we are trying to um, do some uh, work on that. And the WHO um, um, working group that I'm on on uh, housing and health guidelines is doing a series of systematic reviews across the different diseases. Great. So there is some work going on on it. Mm. But, you know, I think you're quite right, the assumptions are heroic and in places. Yeah. You change the assumptions and you can get quite different. At a zero, yeah. Um, I mean, I guess the other things we looked at things like, because um, we tried to look at, you know, was there some evidence on life course on things like education outcomes, employment, and things like that? It was mostly on things like asthma and in the US. So it was kind of difficult to think, well, how do we apply that to something like rheumatic fever or bronchiectasis or something which is actually going to have more impact probably than, than asthma on educational outcomes? Mm. And then how do you account for? the inequities before you even start, you know? Well, you've got asthma going across a quarter of the population yeah. and bronchiectasis has been really severe yes. in a smaller group, yeah. so they're probably both important. Yeah. But I, I do agree, I mean, it's the, it's the currency of policy, I mean, so it's actually really important. Mm. Given that the economists are not doing it, we who are outside economists step in, we've been trying to do things like that's what Tony's been doing. Yeah. Tony. Nice, nice talk to you. I really enjoy it. I really appreciated you pointing out the value stuff. The more we do into this, the more I can make up fancy maps as I do. It inevitably comes down to values. Have you found that having a dollar value here makes any difference when you talk to policymakers or colleagues or NGOs or the press and actually using to showcase one of the rheumatic fever rate differences at the moment or differences in mortality rates? Does it does it, have you gained anything from doing this on that um, policy front? Um, I'm not sure. Um, the only thing I've been able to point out to my DHB is they should spend more on throat swabs because there's a historical inequity on, in their spending on child health in Northland in the lab. And, you know, and so, I mean, there's some things I learned that I can use at a, at a local level to say, actually, this is an ongoing inequity and we should be spending more on child health and you know, shifting funding. Um, but at a national and policy level, I don't know, I kind of, I went up to Northland, you know, then it becomes, <laughs> you have less impact up there than you do sitting in Wellington probably, so I don't know. Um, I think, I mean, there's been certainly some conversations with people in the ministry, but I don't know how much difference it makes. Because at the end of the day, I mean, it would, be, it would be great to have some more conversation with Treasury, really, around this sort of stuff, you know, because at the end of the day, they're the ones that kind of use those figures. The Ministry, I think, needs a much stronger health econ economist kind of input so to some of this stuff. So you one case about the rheumatic heart disease. Yeah. June's involved in this stuff here. Yeah. Even if you don't have an intervention that you can posit, what you can do is work out what intervention has started now, and people who have got is how much money it would save through the health system. And it's yeah. 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 And certainly, um, I looked at um, uh, Jacob Twist has done a PhD in bronchiectasis, and I mean he's done a really good review of sort of life course stuff as well as some of the interventions and all that kind of thing. And I mean, so there is some more data out there on what's going on on some of these things that could be used as well. And I guess some of this. Um, the work that Adrian and others are doing in counties Manukau around preventable hospital admissions and interventions here would also be really interesting to have some economic analysis alongside it. Yeah. What do you think <coughs> needs to happen in terms of progressing the, the impact that research such as this has over policy change? Well, I guess it's never a sort of one-to-one -one relationship, is it? <laughs> And I mean, it's a very preliminary study, so I guess we felt that it was 
more a challenge to the rest of the academic community in a sense than to, we couldn't really go, I mean I wouldn't feel that comfortable to go to politicians and say, come on, this costs 200 million bucks, do something about it. I mean I think you could get shot down pretty quickly. Um, but I think it is a, um, yeah, I think, I think we should be using it partly to argue for more investment in child health and I think that's very coherent with, you know, the, child commission, the Children's Commissioner work and some of the other policy work that's been done, the work in housing that you guys are doing and things like that. So I guess it just adds to the kind of collective <laughs> thought process that hopefully might have an impact on policy a bit down the road. I don't, I don't know, I mean you guys are much more experienced academics than me and probably have a better idea of how it, these things happen. I, I've sort of given up on Wellington. <laughs> Although I have just got some money out of mental health. Kia ora. Mihi māna kia ora koe. He uri ahau te mau na Taranaki. Ko Leo Buchanan Chaka Wikino he taku te tamariki. Onga nui atara. Claire, I've been a pediatrician for over 30 years and I, I chair the Māori Health Committee for the College of, of uh, Physicians, RACP. So this sort of stuff is, is very much a concern that um, mm. we have. Uh, I've always sort of harboured the idea that public health positions were politicians and drag. And, and in, in a sense, uh, in, in a sense uh, some of the approach that you, you're putting out is an important approach uh, actually confirms that. Uh, the, the problem about these things, and you'll know how not straightforward it is, that even if you look at inequities and things like admissions, for example, the outpatient side of things, uh, we know that amongst Māori, worries about things like colic and gastroesophageal reflux are much less evident yeah. than in the European population or in the Asian population. And there's not a lot of worry about anorexia nervosa. Uh, and the point I'm making is that one, I can give you a number of examples of situations where the disparity mm. between outpatient consultations being greater Mm. non body doesn't necessarily prove that that's an advantage. Mm. doesn't necessarily prove it that way. And the second problem, the other side of the coin, when you talk about inpatient admissions, and you'll know this, is that to some extent, the increased usage of inpatient services by Māori is a reflection on access issues to primary yeah. care and monetary issues. Yeah. Mm. So the, the problems are, if you rock up at 7 o'clock at night to your local... DHB hospital, the level of nervousness amongst the junior staff may exceed that amongst a, a GP. Yeah. If you had an experienced GP, you could access. But the, the issue is much more complicated because of the lower rate of enrolment of Māori with, with, with primary mm. care physicians and, and those sorts of problems. And when you talk about mental health issues being uh, less well, uh, a lower frequency amongst Māori, there are some key problems like ADHD and autism, using that word in a broad sense, which um, for varying reasons are either seen, the, the features, the behavioural features of those are either seen or accepted as normal or more normal amongst the Māori population than the non-Māori population. So presentations of some of these things can be delayed. I'm not saying it's a good idea, but mm. it, it illustrates the difficulties, I think, of drawing conclusions just from inpatient numbers or, or outpatient numbers. Yeah. Uh, and really, even the complex question of what to do with poverty, you know, put $10,000 per square mile on Potiwara East or whatever it is, you'll know that by itself, mm. this is not going to cure the problem. Mm. Uh, you know, kefe na araha ki the tamaniki. You know, mm. where, where do we deal with attitudinal changes? Mm. You can pour money in. But if the money is going into uh, a, a, a wano that is hit with alcohol and drug abuse and other things, this money is going to go into thin air. Mm. So it's it's a complex task yeah, absolutely. that you're facing. Mm. And I think this sort of work is important and needs fleshing out. Mm. But I don't think there's any quick fix or no simple answer. Uh, uh, kia ora. Kia ora. Yeah. No, I, I mean, I'd agree with a lot you say. And um, I mean, I think a fundamental issue we do have is primary care access. And I see it very much where I'm working at the moment that, I mean, and it's cost and transport and those things, but it's also a real um, 
mismatch, if you like, between those providing services and those needing them, in a way. Um, and I always think that you know, poverty is not just about socioeconomic poverty, it's really about poverty of the spirit and the mind and all that as well, isn't it, of course? So, and a lot of those things are tied up. But I guess this was just a, I mean, and this is not, I don't think the primary driver for why we should address some of these complex issues at all, but it was a sort of little arrow in from one direction that we felt had been unexplored. So yeah, thanks for your comments. Michael? Very clear. Um, yeah, so many important and interesting messages in your talk. Um, I haven't really had a related question about how we measure things because, of course, some of these measures we use, which are tied in with healthcare utilisation, mm. can be interpreted as positives or negatives depending on <coughs> utilisation and how they're tracking. And I think a simple thing like ACC claims, I mean, we quite often use those to evaluate, say, interventions to reduce home injury rates. Mm. And if we saw lower, ACC plans would say, yes, we're doing something right, but it could, we could be doing something wrong. We may have an access problem. I mean, how would you know in mm. this population, what indicators would you trust that we were doing better in the future? It's a good question, isn't it? I mean, uh, around the ACC one, it seems to me that if you've got high rates of injury causing hospitalisation and death, it, it's a bit bizarre that you've got a lower rate where you have to access primary care to actually get the ACC claim. Pretty much. I mean, you'll get it through hospital, of course, as well. But um, yeah, I mean, I think I, I mean, I think it points out the issues around the, the sort of grossness of our data sets at a national level. And it's not until you burrow down and look at the services and understand a bit of the context that, as you know, as you were saying, that you kind of can pull some of this apart. Um, and it's that, it's that whole thing too of how do you measure demand if you're only looking at the utilisation? I mean, you know, the sort of need versus access. I mean, that's still something I sort of struggle with too because we see clearly um, the end point, if you like, but we don't always see how we can measure ill health better that doesn't turn up, if you know what I mean. We've had the same issue, we've been looking at inequities in the pathway for um, acute management of um, STEMI heart attacks, you know, ST elevation, myocardial infarct, in Northland, because in Northland there is no angiography or PCI, you have to get in a helicopter and be flown down. So I think one person out of the 200 since they started the protocol has actually made it down to Auckland in the 90 minutes from Whangarei. Of course, if you live out the back of the Hokianga, your chance of getting there in 90 minutes is zero. So, you know, obviously we need to be looking at different ways of doing it, I think. But, but I mean, one of the issues there is, is that the, of the people who actually came through this protocol, Māori were more likely to be assessed in primary care and be predict risk assessed, and they had more risk factors, but they were being managed better than non-Māori. But it only worked for those that lived within 30 minutes of Whangarei Hospital. It's kind of a bit of an exclusive <laughs> zone. <laughs> So then, and then you're left with, well, this, this bit that we're looking at doesn't reflect the burden of cardiovascular disease in our community at all. We have mortality rates for Māori are four to six times non-Māori. You know, and so and so what, what are we looking at here? So I, I don't know the answer to your question, to be honest. You're the brainy one, Michael. Figure it out. <laughs> um, I have not thought about how you might present it. I mean, it's down in Wellington. <coughs> and at the paediatric conference, I mm. attended. There was a lot of attention to Jonathan Jarman's, you know, community where they're all been like that's been mm. recently, mm. but no case with mm. this whole combined you know, community, clinician, public health stuff. It was you would have expected ten or something. Mm. There's it been one, so that's that's savings made, <coughs> and I think that's another way of saying look, we do know what to do. We just need to have the resources to do it in a few. So that might be a counterfactual to try and um, say, well, if this was done after the heart hole of Tite Tokara, then some of the children would have lived or the stuff. So modelling mm. up in that way. Mm. And, and, and the other way is sort of counter to that is in the area of homelessness. You know, a million dollar Murray in the States who they worked out this one homeless man you know, spent a million dollars on trying to 
get treatment for her, you know, taking the mood and blah, 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 over a long period. And if you'd have had actually a house, which is much better, and it has some mm. management around it, the, 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 states could, the state that he lived in could have stayed with a million dollars. So his, and those became, become quite pivotal, I think, if you can say, do it this way and mm. save money. You don't want to, of course, personalise it to a particular child or a million dollar Māori did exist, but the community, you know, those communities work together to save this much money and save these many lives. Yeah, and I mean, we, I mean, we have been able to do it for things like vaccination, haven't we? I mean, yeah. you know, I mean, I, I, I could stand up and say we had, you know, 13 cases of meningococcal C in 2011. We had a mass campaign, and we had one that wasn't vaccinated yeah. this last year. You know, and mm -hmm. when you think about the value of a life, the the whole program cost us three million or something. I mean, that's less than one statistical life value. Mm -hmm. And three people died in 2000. I mean, and I mean the same thing with the suicide prevention costing is it's what we spend as peanuts compared to what we lose. Sorry, you've got a question. Well, I just wanted to point out that you do actually have a, an easy headline in your results, and that is the discrepancy between the costs um, and the um, loss of income and the savings to the healthcare system. Yeah. That's a headline, that's just a no-brainer way to get buy-in from public. Next year's an election year, I mean I'm just making connections for you in terms of getting a social movement around inequity, um, yeah. you know, these findings. Um, the, the first thing you do is find the headline in your results and you've got a real no-brainer headline there. Um, and then uh, whether or not you've got some spare cash to, um, to, to get the media coverage um, to follow up on that headline is... Um, Did you see the Sunday Star question. Times one? And you've got the RACP sitting right here who can um, <laughs> respond, yeah. not to mention the Smart Free Coalition and the PHA. <laughs> Um, so, I mean, it's yeah. the collaboration between research results mm. and the um, advocacy organisations, which could be better. The, the, this room could have been filled up. It's, um, it's, a, it's a bit of um, networking that the School of Public Health could probably workshop and be better at. Mm. I mean, one of the challenges is that some politicians are actually bright and they can see through quite quickly mm. the idea of one-on-one -on -one is this is this is happening and this is the cause of this. It's got a whole lot of loopholes in it. So at the level of those that are driving policy, very often you have people that are quite bright that are saying this is it just it doesn't quite stack up. It's not as simple as just getting the public momentum. Of course if you think you're gonna lose your seat that may be another matter. But I think <laughs> I think at the level of of allocating significant sums of money, uh, we shouldn't work on the assumption that just by making a lot of noise, something's going to change. I think it's not, I mean, I, we're not saying it, but no, I think it's more complicated. Than that. Mm -hmm. You talked about political will. Uh, Trevor Convention from the Council of Christian Social Services. We are working based. Uh, we've come to the conclusion that whenever you find a really good evidence based why you should change things, the government does the opposite. <laughs> um, <laughs> the, I tend to agree with, with our friend here that, that perhaps there are ways of of um, using this information creatively. But, you know, listening to Professor Gluckman, he would say that actually there are the evidence-based responses and then there are, there are the political responses. Mm -hmm. And often the political response will be based around can we uh, generate a, a significant level of public concern. Although on the issue of child poverty, um, we do see the public concern, but somehow we also define poor children as being the other. Mm. Um, so we need to be able to create a, a, an emphasis that says this is actually going to impact on more than just Māori children. And somehow we need to create. If, and that does come back to the value statement. How do we value each other? Do we value all of us? And if we value us, then, then what is the investment we should make? Mm. It's, a difficult, it's a difficult journey. Mm. And um, yeah, I agree with your thinking that each uh, part of the jigsaw helps to create um, a greater weight of thinking and a greater weight of, of perhaps pressure as we start to see ways of, of, of addressing some of these wider inequities, both health and wider than existing.
Thank you.